I do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the land that we are on today. Um, so Queen's University and the Kingston area in general is on the uh, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. As I usually tell my class, um, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee histories related to the land and waters here in Kingston, Ontario, where the St. Lawrence River, the Cataraqui River, and Lake Ontario meet is uh, long and complicated and usually not sufficiently explained in your typical uh, land acknowledgement. But I think as historians, it's important and it's really our job to learn and acknowledge this longer history of indigenous peoples, one that predates the arrival of Europeans and the establishment of colonies and settlements. At the same time, and especially with the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation just around the corner uh, tomorrow, uh, it's also very important to acknowledge that Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and other indigenous peoples have lived and continue to live here today. Um, I would like to now introduce our two visiting speakers. Um, so to begin, we have Candice Brunette de Basique, who is Mishkego Cree from Pitabek, Treaty 9 territory with Cree and French ancestry. Candice is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Western University, located on the lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lenape peoples in London, Ontario, Canada. Currently, Candice is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Western University, where she serves as a university-wide teaching fellow in Indigenous learning. Candice's work and professional practices center on advancing the liberatory struggles of Indigenous peoples in educational settings. Her current research agenda is located in the areas of Indigenous and decolonial approaches to curriculum, educational change, leadership, and policy. Her scholarly work embodies a deep commitment to advancing Indigenous theorizing, Indigenous methodologies, methodologies and research, and Indigenous pedagogical approaches to teaching and learning. Thomas Peace, our other speaker today, is an Associate Professor of History at Huron University College. Tom's research focuses on the histories of education and colonialism in 18th and 19th century Northeastern North America. Tom is a founding editor of ActiveHistory.ca and co-director of the Huron Community History Center. Tom's work has been published by Akadziensis, Historical Studies in Education, and History Compass. And he is the author of two open educational resources, the Open History Seminar with Sean Karaj, and A Few Words That Changed the World, as well as co-editor with Catherine LaBelle of uh, the book From Huronia to Wendakes, published by University of Oklahoma Press in 2016. Um, so without further ado, I will pass the floor to our speakers. Thank you very much. Sego, Wache, Ani, thank you for having us today. Uh, thank you for the introductions. I'd also like just to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the territories that we're gathered here today, the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territories and pay my respects to the elders and the Indigenous knowledge holders of this land, and also just take a moment to pause and to think about those survivors of Indian residential schools, as tomorrow is a very important day, the second official National Truth and Reconciliation Day. Um, erasure and elimination are considered a key organizing principle of settler colonial society. As Patrick Wolfe has long asserted, Settler colonial invasion is not an event. It is a structure that actively seeks to break down indigenous nationhood and presence on Turtle Island. Settler colonialism operates through dispossessing indigenous peoples of their land by imposing settler laws on indigenous peoples. <coughs> Early universities like Western University, which we'll talk about today, and Huron College, its founding college, were actively involved in the settler colonial project through the perpetuation of settler ideologies and laws in education. 
Considering these colonial or origins of the academy, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called forward to universities to take action and redress harms done to Indigenous peoples through re-education and decolonization. And among these appeals have been calls for universities to create courses. We've heard about them all that educate all students about the role of colonialism in Canada and Indigenous settler relations in our country. In this research project that we'll share with you today, we come together as two scholars based in two different fields of study um, to work towards a community-driven project to re-educate students and society about how colonialism is experienced at a particular institution in a particular time and place with a particular focus on a specificity of London, Ontario, Western University and its institutional histories and relationships to settler colonialism and Indigenous relations. In our work, we not only look at settler colonialism, but we trace the presence and agency and experiences of Indigenous peoples at our university. In doing so, our project really strives to undo that erasure that I talked about earlier, of Indigenous people's voices and contributions to universities at Western and in general. Before we get into our project, uh, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge our, how our positionalities come into the work. This is an important tenant of Indigenous research methodologies. People like Margaret Kovach, as well as um, Oh my gosh, uh, Willett and um, Absalon have long asserted the, the need to locate oneself in research. So we start, we, we'd like to start there. I think you have a little bit of a context about my, my location. I'm a Meshkego Cree woman, a uh, member with Fort Albany, also referred to as Peter Beck. Uh, I've lived away from my community my entire life. Um, so I'm an off-reserve, mixed, uh, my, my father, my paternal side is French, um, and I've worked and lived outside my territory for quite some time, so now I find myself living and working in London, which I, I, I actually consider myself a visitor to that territory in a sense, although a close relative of visitor. So I recognize how that complex positionality comes into this work. I'd like to make full disclosure to the room that I'm not a historian, although I have a buddy interest in the history of higher education. The, Indigenous history of higher education because there's there's really uh, large gaps in terms of the, the research in this area. So I've worked collaboratively with Tom who brings the historian perspective into an interview. And I'll allow Tom to introduce himself. That puts the pressure on a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thanks, Candace. I'd also like to just acknowledge the land that we're on, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe lands. And thanks, Scott, for that land acknowledgement that recognizes the waters uh, of this uh, place, water, uh, waters that we share in the Lower Great Lakes uh, Basin, and, uh, and the significance of waterways uh, to the world in which we live today, and of course, uh, the world of the past. I also think it's important to recognize that this place, actually a little bit uh, further to uh, the west, was one of uh, the key centers in the early 19th century where uh, Indigenous peoples uh, and uh, colonial structures of education really came, first came uh, into interaction around the Bay of Quinte area uh, uh, just to our, uh, our east. I'm a settler scholar. I come to this work um, from a very uh, awkward place. So, so when Candace puts uh, the, the weight of the historian on me, it always makes me a little apprehensive in a room full of historians uh, because uh, my work has really focused on primarily the 18th century and primarily the geography east of Lake Champlain, primarily Mi'kmaq and Wabanaki territories. And I come to this project, though, having been hired at Huron University College, which is an affiliated college at Western, but Western's founding college, uh, in 2014, just as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, uh, was filing its, its final report. And uh, as I read through the calls to action then, I thought uh, that it was incumbent upon me as a historian who worked in the area of colonialism and education to begin probing my own institution's history, which as I'll talk about in a few moments, dates back to the mid-19th century and uh, is rooted in Anglican 
uh, uh, civilizational Christianity, for lack of uh, a lack of a better term. And so, uh, my place uh, here has really been doing that research, but also doing that research primarily through teaching. So I created a couple of courses to look at Huron's uh, own history. So part of what I'm presenting. Uh, today, when I, when I speak as, as part of our presentation, is uh, our, my students' work. And I think I need to be really transparent about that, that I'm not taking, I'll take all the blame, I won't take all the blame, but any, a lot of the credit should go uh, to go to those students, and some of those students I'll name uh, when, it's, uh, when it's appropriate. Uh, do you want to introduce uh, Sure. Some? Yeah, so we have, uh, this is a, a collaborative project with another scholar at our institution, Sally Kiwiash. Sally Kiwiash is actually affiliated with the Kijwanong First Nation, which is Waffle Island, and she's an Anishinaabe and Cree, and she works as an instructor and she's a filmmaker in our Faculty of Information Media Studies. So Sally is um, a part of the team. She's a, uh, she's a par partner in the research project, and she will help be helping us take our research findings and produce a film, which we're going to be working on over the next year. We're really in a very preliminary phase of our research, so we will. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of sharing with you preliminary findings. We haven't completed our full analysis. We've gathered a ton of data, and we, we hope to you know, engage in conversation with you today. Maybe there's uh, things that you can bring to our attention that we are not aware of. So uh, we don't, we're not making a lot of big claims today about our research. I think we're still, we're still figuring it out as we go. Do you want to add on to that, maybe? No, I mean, I think that's a good, uh, I'll just say, uh, being somewhat familiar with your department, I mean, I know that they're, they're, it's kind of intimidating to talk to a bit because there's people here, I think, who have a lot uh, to contribute to uh, kind of our understanding of, of the 19th century. So this is a project a bit outside of both of our uh, wheelhouses, but I think uh, what we're, one of the things that we want to try to convince you of today is that it's an important project and that it's an important project for those of us working in universities to uh, take on more broadly uh, than just the Western example that we'll provide uh, for you. Yeah, and just to add on to that, it's exploratory, so we imagine other research to come out of this, like we're going to identify a lot of gaps and areas that other students we hope will build on, and uh, you're going to see that we cover a really wide time period, and that's probably one of the limitations of it, and that's why it's very preliminary and exploratory. All right, so just to talk a little bit uh, about our research and how it's situated theoretically. So our research obviously is coming within the Canadian university context, and we recognize that the university context is founded on a westernized university system. So it's a system that Ramon Grofagel has long asserted has been transplanted. It's been transplanted to Turtle Island, imposed on Indigenous peoples, and continues to maintain an, uh, an allegiance with geographic linguistics and um, political ties to Europe, European languages, uh, Eurocentric ways of knowing, and the English language. Um, as such, this university system um, reinforces what Mi'kmaq scholar Marie Batiste in the field of education has long asserted as cognitive imperialism. The taken for granted ways in which universities naturalize Euro-Western theories, uh, canons, foundations, ideologies, norms, and values, not only as the norm, but as superior and universal. We draw on settler colonial theory as well, um, which I talked about at the beginning, as, a sh as structured around the power system and occupation of the settler colonial state on Indigenous lands. And alongside this occupation, an underlying settler colonial logic that attempts to disappear Indigenous peoples, forcing Indigenous peoples to either assimilate or die in order to legitimize the settler takeover. More relevant to education, the establishment of universities is intertwined within a colonial project and universities have served to perpetuate the master colonial narrative that silence Indigenous voices and undermine Indigenous presence. So in our work, we also work from a theoretical framework of um, trying to find those stories of survivance, indigenous survivance, originally put forward by Anishinaabe literary scholar Gerald Visnor, makes visible indigenous stories of resistance to settler colonialism and their persistence in telling their stories within pockets, um, claiming space within colonial institutions. We really, uh, are, are finding value from Sandy Grande's work uh, 
she extends that concept of survivance to an academic context where she claims that in Indigenous peoples in universities are asserting survivance. And they're not doing it only alone. They're often doing it with non-Indigenous peoples where they're working together to unmap the structures and processes of and discourses of settler colonialism. So we're, we're drawing on some of those concepts to frame up our work. While we argue that the academy is intertwined within the politics, within these politics where Indigenous voices remain often muted, uh, we assert that by retracing history and the structures of settler colonialism in university stories, we can find those pockets of Indigenous survivance stories uh, that have remained um, deeply invested. And when we go back into the archive and talking to people, which we'll talk to you about, about how we, we, we approach this, is we are finding that Indigenous peoples have contributed from, from the very beginning um, of, of the founding of the university, but, but these stories have remained not untold. So we are really hoping to contribute to unmapping and interrogating dominant institutional narratives in our work. We've gone to founding stories, uh, university founding stories, newspaper archives, institutional reports, meeting minutes to, to find the absence and those, those pockets of, of Indigenous um, stories there. Okay, let me just uh, flip over slides here. Um, just before we get into Western's history, one of the things I wanted to present to you uh, from, uh, from some of uh, this work is uh, the early roots of the New England Company. The New England Company uh, was uh, an organization created in 1649 really to support English uh, evangelical efforts in New England, but it was created in, uh, in the United Kingdom by, uh, by an act of parliament, uh, and its purpose was the building of universities, schools, and nurseries of literature settled for further instructing and civilizing indigenous populations into English culture. And there's a bit of a gloss there between the direct quote, obviously, and, and some more uh, present day uh, language. Um, and I, I want to start with the New England Company because as some of you may know, the New England Company uh, was deeply involved in founding schools and operated two of uh, Canada's earliest residential schools. The disastrous, well they're both disastrous actually, but the, the, the school at Sussex Vale which really, in New Brunswick, which never really gets off the ground because it was just such a, a horrendous um, experiment, was run by the New England Company and upon the failure of that, uh, enterprise, the New England Company moved west to uh, Six Nations of the Grand River uh, and founded the Mohawk Institute. And the reason why I begin with the New England Company is because uh, the company's reporting structure has not well uh, been well developed. There's a handful, so you can find, you can uh, uh, take a quick look through a uh, journal database. There are a couple of uh, academic articles that, that do tease this out, but not in much depth and not as it's focused on universities themselves, at least not that I've seen. And uh, the reason why I point this out is because when we look at the structure of the New England Company in the 1660s, it provided funds for two missionary teachers that were to be dispersed through the office of the president at Harvard College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and its reporting structure was structured through Trinity College at Oxford University. And I bring this forward because one of the arguments that uh, we want to present to you today is that the university world and the world of residential schools, and in some of my other work I would say the world of public schooling as well, are not as separated as we have tended to treat them as, uh, as historians. And so in the early days of, uh, of the New England Company, we can see how its mandate uh, integ integrated and wove into uh, uh, missionary schools, early kind of residential schools, and the university structure. One historian of missionaries in New England and New York uh, suggests that the majority of New England Company missionaries were actually trained at Harvard University. Uh, and in fact, as, as some of you may know, Harvard, uh, William and Mary, and Dartmouth College all have uh, early histories uh, with, um, with a vision for uh, educate, educating, I put quotation marks because we have to be careful what, what, what we mean by that, by that word, but uh, educating indigenous, uh, indigenous students. So I wanted to start there before I uh, turn to uh, 
uh, Huron and Western specific history of Anglican uh, settler colonialism. And, uh, and, and because we can see the legacy of the New England Company, and here I'm not just talking uh, uh, in generalities, I mean in specifics. The New England Company is, uh, is active funding uh, students at Huron uh, and at uh, the precursors of Western University. These are almost all university students who left the Mohawk Institute. Um, and, uh, and we see an indigenous presence at Western right from uh, the beginning. Western was founded in 1877 by a group of alumni and faculty from Huron University College, which at that time, uh, not so much today, uh, uh, but we still do, we still do this, but it's a much, a very small part of our, uh, our collegiate life, but at that time was only an Anglican seminary, uh, also in London, and this group of alumni and faculty encouraged the building of an undenominational school of arts, law, medicine, and engineering. So they encouraged the bishop, the Anglican bishop uh, Isaac Helmuth, to uh, work towards building uh, building this Western University, as they called it. In the, in the room at uh, at that time was uh, the man in the top right, uh, Isaac Barefoot. He was an Onondaga uh, teacher. Uh, who trained at Huron to become an Anglican priest in the 1870s. He was a survivor of the Mohawk Institute. He trained to become a teacher at the Toronto Normal School, and then he taught at the Mohawk Institute before, uh, before, becoming, uh, before becoming a priest. And why, uh, why this is important is because all of the students, and there's about 10 of them, uh, who are in London in uh, uh, one of four different schools, or three different schools, Huron, uh, or Helmuth's two residential high schools, the Helmuth Boys, I'm gonna call it Helmuth Boys, Boys College, but it was called Helmuth College, which is down in the bottom, uh, had uh, two, uh, two boys from the Mohawk Institute at it the late, in the early 1870s, and in the top was Helmuth Ladies College, that's why I just wanted to make that the distinction, because Helmuth liked to name things after himself, uh, so uh, the ladies, it, it, it was formerly called Helmuth Ladies College, and it also had two uh, young women from, from the Mohawk Institute there. So there's this cohort of, uh, of indigenous students who were present at the school. Barefoot is involved in the group petitioning to create Western University. Uh, and when they go about, uh, when, when the act is uh, passed in 1878 to create uh, Western, these people are uh, also recruited into fundraising for the school. So two Anglican Anishinaabe missionaries, John Jacobs and Henry uh, Pahatokwam Chase, uh, were recruited by Helmuth to go to the United Kingdom as part of their fundraising efforts to fundraise for, uh, for the Western University. And in 1881, Helmuth claimed, uh, made this claim about the future of the university. When the Western University is opened, Indians from different parts uh, will continue to avail themselves of the grand privileges of obtaining a university education. And so uh, what we can see here in this early founding is we can see these connections to the Mohawk Institute. All of these students are funded by the New England Company, uh, which is running the Mohawk Institute. But there's also a vision uh, for a place for Indigenous students at Western that is held by both Haudenosaunee and, uh, and uh, some Anishinaabe individuals. And I, and I don't want to push that too far because there's a lot of complicated things going on here around what exactly uh, education uh, means, but it's important to recognize that these people are present at Western's founding and that they're involved in the discussions uh, and, uh, and, share some of the, and do share some of, uh, of the vision. Now that's one half of the story. The other half of the story has to do uh, with, um, uh, with the person who created this document. Now, if you're, in, if you're interested in kind of a very self-centered, kind of interesting autobiographical lens into uh, late 19th century life, I'd recommend uh, looking through this um, autobiographical, graphic autobiographical journal by a man named Edward Francis Wilson. He was the first librarian at Huron College. He was a student there in the 1860s. Uh, he, became, uh, he became an Anglican priest and a missionary, and he ended up uh, go, uh, do, carrying out a lot of his work in Bawating, uh, what's known today as Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and uh, while he was there, he learned of a vision at Garden River First Nation for uh, a teaching wigwam, Chief Xingwangong's uh, 
who uh, was one of the leaders at Garden River, had this vision for a teaching wigwam, and Wilson thought he could uh, help make it manifest. And so he fundraises for it in, in England with some support from Garden River. And, uh, and they build a school in 1873. Any guesses how long that school lasted? Does anyone know? Six days. It lasted six days. It was burnt to the ground, which tells you something about uh, uh, the reception of, uh, of this idea uh, in Garden River. So although it was an idea that exists, pre-existed at Garden River, it's not an idea that was uh, picked up upon. And uh, it, it, Wilson wasn't one to be deterred. He went back, moved the school to Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and in 1875 opened the Shingwak Industrial Home and the Wawanosh Home for Girls. Uh, two long-standing residential schools, the Shingwak Industrial Home closed in 1970. Uh, again, one of uh, uh, the earliest uh, residential schools. He did that though, that's Isaac Helmuth, who I was talking about earlier, Huron's, uh, Huron's uh, founder and Western's founder. Uh, oh, thanks Candace. And Helmuth was at the opening of the Shingwak, uh, of the Shingwak Industrial Home. And more importantly, the woman on Helmuth's right, Miss Peach, uh, was a, a significant donor to the school. And this is really what got the ball rolling on my end of the research because I was up at Sault Ste. Marie uh, working uh, in the archives at the Shingwak Residential School Center uh, trying to tease out some of this. And when I learned about Miss Peach, I, 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 uh, something clicked for me because if you can, if you can read it, said it makes reference to her brother Alfred Peach. And Alfred Peach is a prominent figure in Western's history. So Kezia Peach uh, donates this, a significant amount of fund, uh, funds to uh, the Shingwak Residential School. To Shingwak Residential School, uh, Wilson reflects that it was mainly through Kezia Peach's generosity that I was enabled to start the Shingwak Home and afterwards the Wawanosh. And Alfred was doing the same thing for both Huron. He actually funds Helmuth's position, uh, uh, and and for Western. And Alfred Peach actually becomes, when Helmuth leaves, he leaves under questionable circumstances, which is something we don't quite know why, but he leaves almost immediately in 1884. And he was replaced as Western's Chancellor by Alfred Peach. Alfred Peach was Western's Chancellor from 1884 to 1900. And in fact, uh, if on the Western uh, crest, uh, this two-tailed uh, lion is said to, now this is where uh, my historical uh, research skills are a little lax, but this is from a West, Western, this is from Western's, uh, Western's uh, uh, corporate identity, I suppose. That image is said to come from the Peach family crest. I don't, I've not found the Peach family crest, but Western says it comes from that, so that in, in and of itself I think is an important uh, point to draw out, is that Alfred Peach is considered a founding figure at Western. So, in one side, we have these primarily Haudenosaunee and a handful of Anishinaabe uh, uh, men uh, and a handful of, uh, uh, of young uh, women who are engaging in the system, who are pushing and, 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 and I hesitate to say share the vision, but to see something there. And on, on the other side, we have this settler vision that's building residential schools and funding them. And, uh, and, and, and this is where uh, this research comes together. So when Candace talked about founding stories, this is, this is what we meant. I'll turn it back over to you. So a little bit about our research. So our, our research right now, uh, we, we have two research questions. Um, and it's emerging from this context and this need to, to, to retell Western story, um, bringing that uh, lack of Indigenous indigenous presence to the fore. Um, so we have uh, what, what indigenous educational initiatives have taken place at Western since founding to present, so you can see it's a very long period of time, and how have indigenous experience, people's experiences been shaped by settler colonialism over time. And we are gathering um, these stories, and we, we look at documents of stories, through multiple uh, multiple methods, so we are talking to people, um, and where I come in is uh, my my focus uh, in the area of indigenous education is more on the policy side. So I look at um, indigenous education, educational policies in universities and indigenous leaders' experiences. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with the last 40, 40, 50 years, um, and then. Prior to that, um, this is where 
my, <laughs> my training is not um, very strong, but um, so we're talking to people who have experienced the last, you know, at least the last 20, 30 years, and we're talking to about 22 people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, who have been affiliated or affiliated with Indigenous initiatives at Western. It could be former alumni, staff, students. So we've actually done that work now. We've also uh, looked at documents. So we've gone into the institutional archives and uh, we've looked at board and senate meetings from 1920 onward and we've systematically searched them. So we've developed a bit of an algorithm to be able to go through the digital documents and search for keywords, which has been very helpful because we have a lot of documents, over 200 documents. We've also looked at Western news and some of the local newspapers in the region. Indigenous newspapers have been extremely helpful. Student newspapers have been extremely helpful for a counter narrative because we know that the institution's way that they talk about themselves tends to be one way, and, um, or not one way, but can be biased in a sense. So we are uh, really relying on those other sources as well. And we've uh, been able to access Indian news, which has been very helpful to us. Uh, some work at the University of Winnipeg has been done by Mary Jane McCallum to digitize uh, INAX Indian news from like 1950 to the 70s. So that, that archive has been extremely helpful for uh, finding those points of reference. We look at uh, a lot of institutional reports and uh, academic literature, of course. So those are the main sources of knowledge uh, or stories that we're looking at. And we are doing a bit of a thematic analysis right now. We have all of our documents and interviews and we're working through the NVivo system to come up with a thematic analysis. We are working with a time frame uh, as well. So we've developed a bit of a timeline and we're able to sort of um, it's very preliminary, see where there's trends over certain time periods, and that's how we're going to possibly approach uh, categorizing and, and disseminating some of these. So we're seeing like, like a lot of activity at certain periods of time, and we can really connect uh, how this uh, is connected to larger policy movements in the country. So that's been very helpful, and we're also, of course, because we're doing a documentary film, we're working with a storied approach. So we'll be, we haven't quite gotten there yet. That's our, after we do the thematic analysis and the timeline, we'll, we'll move into that second part. Um, yeah, so this just tells you a little bit about how we hope to disseminate the findings. We, we do hope to, we've been talking about different academic journal articles that we could have approached for different you know, time periods and so forth. Uh, we do want to create a uh, digital website and archive um, which we're going to do on our own. And we want to really uh, approach this website from a place-based perspective, so where we really privilege the land and moving from that to, the, to uh, a bit of an interactive website. So you can click on different sections and periods and get more information. We have so much information that we could archive on the website that other people can build on. So we really are excited about that. And of course the documentary film, which will be fairly short. We're thinking maybe 30, 35 minutes. Okay, so we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to uh, uh, one of the uh, really important things to uh, acknowledge about the history I uh, just told you, and that's, that's really kind of a summary of what we've been doing, or what I've been doing with my students over the past uh, seven or eight years, uh, is that the presence of Indigenous students in, uh, at Huron and at, at Western stops. It stops almost as soon as it begins. So there's this promise uh, that Western will be for Indigenous and English students. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't happen. And the question is, why doesn't it happen? And uh, I put a, a, a graph of uh, the number of residential schools by year here to illustrate a broader apparatus of policies, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with, uh, that can really be summed up, I think, in the Indian Act and its many uh, amendments, which gets harsher and harsher and harsher over the end of the 19th and beginning of uh, the 20th century. And we might, uh, might encapsulate those, that, that, that tightening of restrictions on Indigenous peoples around the threat of enfranchisement uh, or losing uh, status uh, and uh, the connection to nation uh, because of uh, the threat of attending, uh, attending a university. Uh, 
And so uh, this coincides with as Western is uh, being built, these laws and, and, the re and, re and residential school policies are all beginning to ramp up. <coughs> and so we can look at this host of, uh, it's not just one thing, right? But it's this host uh, of, uh, of, of policies that make it very difficult for indigenous peoples to, even if they had wanted to, and there's, in the next slide, I, I'm going to talk about some of the problematic aspects of on, life on campus in this period, uh, but even if they had wanted to, it was very difficult for indigenous people to attend, uh, att attend the university in this period. Although, we will get to, in a moment, uh, uh, the reasons why in the 1960s and 70s uh, things begin to change, which I just want to signal to uh, here. At Western, though, this period, uh, really starting in the 1910s to the 1940s, uh, and extends right up, not quite into the present, although there'd be an argument to say that it continues into the present, um, it becomes even harder to, I think, to be on Western's campus. At Huron, in 1911, Huron opened something called the Huron Missionary Museum, which was a collection of objects taken from Anglican missions around the world. The foundation of that collection was donated by the man on the top left, a man named TBR Westgate, Rex Westgate as he went by. And he was a missionary in uh, Paraguay and in Tanzania, known as German East Africa uh, from an from a imperial lens. Uh, up until uh, about 1920, and so he donated all of uh, all of these artifacts. Um, and um, and what, what's important about Westgate, though, uh, and, and how I want to tie these two things together, is Westgate in 1913 he receives an honorary degree from Huron, and uh, and this is just before the First World War, which is important. And at that uh, ceremony. Uh, the Anglican Church, uh, I don't know who uh, uh, in the Anglican Church, but the Anglican Church approaches him about potentially, um, uh, potentially, well, potentially running, now for drying a blank on the name of the other oh, is, uh, potentially running a new organization called the Indian and Eskimo Commission. And what the Indian and Eskimo Commission uh, was, it, it, became something in 1920, after the First World War, was a consolidation of all of the Anglican Church's residential schools in Canada, from moving from diocesan operation to a more central organizational structure. So Westgate uh, is involved in the Church's global missions, he's involved in creating this missionary museum, which exists from 1911 to 1941, and uh, then he goes on to run uh, for several, uh, several decades uh, the Anglican Church's residential schools. To give you a sense about what resi residential schools meant in this time period, I also put this picture up because this picture is captioned on the Anglican Church's archival website as TBR Westgate. Uh, he's at the residential school in Chapleau, Ontario, with their youngest pupil. That's the caption. And, and if you uh, look at uh, the, the age of that child, you'll recognize that that child can't be more uh, than one or two uh, years old, which I think gives you a sense about uh, uh, what the what this system looked like in this period. I also wanted to signal to the Huron Missionary Museum because Western, uh, through its president, Sherwood Fox, uh, approaches a local collector of indigenous uh, material culture named Wilfred Jury. He's got actually quite an extensive collection. He's an amateur archaeologist. And uh, Sherwood Fox and Jury cook up uh, this idea of building a museum at Western. The museum is opened in 1933. It's called the Museum of Indian Archaeology and Pioneer Life. And you, from that name, I think you can see the ways in which the museum situates indigenous peoples into the past and situates settlers into, uh, into the future. And these museums, uh, the Missionary Museum was done in 1941, but the Museum of Indian Archaeology and Pioneer Life actually still exists in London. It exists as uh, the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, is what it's called today, and there's a Fanshawe Pioneer Village. So the museum separates in the 1950s. Uh, but this is a, a, a good example. We've heard, as Candace will share with you, I don't think she's going to share with you this specific anecdote, but she's going to share with you some of the things we've heard in some of the interviews that we've had with people. We've heard about the ways in which this museum, being on campus, in instructional spaces, was uh, um, made indigenous people feel incredibly uncomfortable. The last piece, for those of you, who, well, given that we all live in Ontario, is Fox and, uh, and Jury also go on to create uh, the museum complex in Simcoe County, uh, 
the best known of the four museums there is St. Marie among the Huron. And uh, they do so using Western funds and Western students. Western removes itself from the operation of those museums in 1968. Uh, and so this complex of museums is telling a very specific story that is not ignoring Indigenous peoples, but it's telling a history of Indigenous peoples that removes them from the present, which I think is really important. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Candice. So the emergence of Indigenous students, uh, of course, pops up in our research. Uh, Tom's alluded to some of the earliest Indigenous men who attended Huron and uh, became ordained as priests like Isaac Barefoot, John Jacob, Simpson Brigham, um, are all identified. We, we draw on work of Jacqueline Briggs, who talks about Norman, Licker, Lor, Norman Lickers of Six Nations of the Grand River, who graduated, and according to our documents, is one of the first to graduate from Western in 1933, or 31. Um, he graduated in politics and economics in the fall, uh, and he, he actually had connections to Huron College as well. He was a residential school survivor as well, uh, like many of the others from the Mohawk Institute. And according to Jacqueline Briggs, while enfranchisement laws were in place at the time of his graduation, liquors never had it thrusted upon him. Uh, but he graduated in 1934 and he went on to become the first First Nations man to, to become a, a lawyer. He went to Osgood. Uh, during the enfranchisement period from 1876 to 1961, uh, First Nations peoples were obviously dissuaded heavily from going to universities. Uh, this is uh, connected to the Indian Act, enfranchisement, voluntary and involuntary laws um, that really affected the representation that we see of Indigenous peoples in, in universities during that time. After the 1961 amendment, we start to see more Indigenous <coughs> presence, uh, student presence at the university. Different figures start to show up, women start to show up. Uh, we have uh, According to the records and documents that we've gathered, James Bartolin graduating in 1963, the first medical doctor from Oneida Nation of the Thames, Irwin Andhone, in 1975, David Newhouse in 1975 as well from a BA in um, Business Admin, and Roberta Jameson here at the top. Uh, many know Roberta Jameson from her work at uh, Inspire. Uh, who graduated with a law degree in 1976, and Jessica Hill, or sorry, 1974, and Jessica Hill at the bottom, the first Oneida woman from Oneida Nation of the Thames uh, to graduate in 1976. We also have uh, identified some of the first PhDs to graduate, which was much, much later, uh, in 2005 with Ruby Slipper Jack from the Faculty of Education. And we, we also, have been able to uh, gather all of the, in, the known uh, Indigenous honorary doctorates and uh, dating back to the earliest in 1948, uh, who has actually a connection to Queens. Uh, Gilbert Clarence Montour, who was Mohawk from Six Nations of the Grand River, he was a civil servant and grandson of Joseph Brandt, and he also graduated from Queens in 1921, so much the, earlier than Norman Lickers. Uh, he was a mining engineer. Uh, there's also another 20 honorary Indigenous doctorates that we've been able to gather, and we will have those uh, profiles and there's convocation speeches on our website. Uh, the emergence after the 70s uh, connected to you know larger Indigenous resistance movements certainly ramp up, and we can see that in the documents that we are uh, looking at. Uh, beyond, you know, Indigenous students and alumni, not, not faculty members, <laughs> but Indigenous students and alumni, we've uh, identified over 90 Indigenous programs that surfaced at different points, uh, key moments, key Indigenous moments uh, that were uh, led by Indigenous peoples often. Um, this includes, you know, pro academic programs, student programs, events, building, buildings and services. We also identify a lot of policy connections and uh, we'll be working to thread those and make, make more sense of those in our uh, dissemination. We can really see a lack of presence, of course, which is not surprising prior to the 1970s. 
uh, some early initiatives that that um, that have been really important to document is some admissions work that happened at the university. Um, and a lot of this admission work is still in place today. Um, the earliest at uh, the law school special admissions process in 1973, I believe uh, Roberta Jameson uh, participated in this particular process. We have uh, a committee, a Senate committee, that pops up in 1979. Doesn't really result in anything. Um, but it's nonetheless very interesting. Uh, Schulich Medical Pathway in 2002, and then a, an undergrad general uh, special admissions pathway in 2006. And obviously some committee work. Um, the most long-standing committee that's had uh, quite an impact at the university over time uh, has been what we call now IPEC, the Indigenous Post-Secondary Education Council, but in its early days it was called AEEC, or Aboriginal Education and Employment Council. Some of the academic work that's popped up over time, sadly, uh, didn't last. And these, uh, we, we found some struggle with academic development at the university, especially early on. Uh, the Indian Teachers Education Program lasted for 10 years. It no longer exists. There was a, a really interesting 10-year or 11-year period with um, it's not necessarily an academic program, but it's a research kind of center, a hub, and it's called the Native Learning Resource Center. It's not for students, it's actually for, well, students are engaged in it, but they're engaged in research, participatory action research, like activities, and it's uh, overseen by the Cross-Cultural Learning Center, which now is not affiliated with the university, it's its own independent organization, Downtown London, but it was a space early on in the 70s that really um, was like this hub of activity and people were doing really interesting research projects on all sorts of different topics. So we have some really fun stories from, from those days and we have some, we're really looking forward to showing how the Cross-Cultural Learning Center was one of the first kind of uh, organizations on campus to really support Indigenous peoples. And then we have a program for, uh, for Native people in journalism, which and went. Oh, yes. So, how are we doing for time? We're okay? We're probably getting close to the news wrap up, but I think we should definitely talk about this. Yeah. Um, so, the surviving stories, those, those stories of, of, of resistance, um, certainly come up in a lot of the you know, interviews more, more, than, more than anything. But we found this one, um, it was like a an obituary story um, related to um, Patricia Montour, who was a graduate of Western, and she's passed away. And um, one of her, I guess, student colleagues uh, wrote an obituary story about her, and we came across this, and we thought this was really uh, poignant. Uh, so Trish Montour, um, she wrote this book in, uh, or she passed away in 2010. She's a Mohawk scholar, if you don't know who she is. She's a legal professor. And she's done incredible work. If you if you know anything about Indigenous education, she's she's definitely uh, one of the one of uh, people to remember. But this obituary story was written by a former graduate of that journalism program, and his name was Dan David. He described Dr. Montour back in the day as stubbornly determined and not afraid to stand up to the erasure of Indigenous peoples in education at, in Western classrooms. He specifically recounts an experience in an anthropology course at, at Western where she, as an undergrad student, challenged the prep professor's representation or misrepresentation of Indigenous peoples as being in the past. Um, she then even led a walkout in the class, uh, in that particular class, and he described her as, quote unquote, the backbone of their little rebellion, the heart and soul. And so I really just, um, wanted to, you know, give her a nod. Uh, some enduring sites of Indigenous presence, though, that uh, come after the 90s, and um, this is probably something, uh, the context of in, uh, the rise of Indigenous student services on university campuses became a provincial policy priority in, in the 90s under the ETS policy framework, so you, we, we see that at Western, certainly. In 1993, Indigenous Services, now called the Indigenous Student Center, comes into the fold. 
and becomes a, an administrative part of the university. There's a commitment, but it's operating on uh, still uh, insecure funding. It's not funded, uh, you know, it's funded by the ministry funding, and, and so it's, it's, there's some challenges there, certainly from um, different uh, perspectives. Uh, First Nation Studies, now called Indigenous Studies, emerges in 2003. We have some really interesting stories from local Indigenous peoples who were on the AEC, the Aboriginal Education Employment Council, who really pushed. So it was external Indigenous partners who were sitting on these voluntary committees pushing the university to create in the First Nation Studies program. And then we have different people that we've interviewed that you know play different roles, um, both both in those um, <coughs> bodies, uh, those work, those units, those organizations, and they talk about their stories of struggle over the years to sustain and thrive in the university. Then we have uh, the Masters of Aboriginal uh, uh, Educational Leadership, the MPED program, which is ongoing and starting. So there is some, some enduring presence, but there's, there, there's sites of struggle as well as presence. So I, we've, we've gone a little bit long. So we wanted to end with, uh, I don't know if anyone, we don't know if anyone's doing this work at uh, Queen's or not, but we thought we would uh, plant some seeds uh, if, uh, if not, or, or, or maybe talk about ways in which we see some alignment uh, with Queen's, but I, I, I'll just speak really briefly to this slide and we can get to it in questions if you're interested. But I will uh, highlight Caitlin Harvey's recent dissertation, which you can't actually get, but you can look up Caitlin Harvey and ask her about it. Uh, uh, but she looks at Queen's as part of this, uh, as part of this dissertation uh, that came out uh, last year. Uh, it's, a, it's a really important work that she's transforming into a book, which is one of the reasons why you can't get some bargo. Uh, but uh, but uh, I just want to call your attention to her work, which is uh, really fantastic. Um, the two men who I've listed uh, on on the top are both uh, early uh, early people in Kingston's uh, history. Louis Vincent Swanton uh, was a Wendat teacher who came here with John Stewart, came here to uh, Kataraqui in uh, in 1784 with the with the Mohawk, taught at the Mohawk school. Uh, and Peter Edmund Jones, who you may know, uh, was one of uh, Canada's first uh, medical doctors, trained here at Queen's and, and uh, graduated in 1866. His uh, thesis is actually on the, using traditional medicine in, uh, in medical practice, which is, which is interesting. As I think many of the Canadian historians know, well, hopefully the Treaty 9, uh, the changes in how we think about Treaty 9 happened because of a, doc, a journal that's in uh, Queen's archives. Uh, I just quick, and then the last two points, uh, really quickly, I just, um, Queen's Journal is uh, accessible through the Internet Archive, and I just keyword searched Indian, uh, and there's lots of stuff in the Queen's Journal uh, about uh, Indigenous peoples and stereotypes about Indigenous peoples. Um, and lastly, uh, Jackson uh, Pin, who uh, just finished his PhD in the Faculty of Education here last year, uh, OCR'd all of the uh, agency records related to Curve Lake First Nation. Uh, and um, just off, in an offhand reference to me one, one day, said, there's a lot of stuff about Queens in there. And I thought it was interesting in terms of Western, but I thought I'd communicate that to you. And the two documents on the slide, one is, um, now I'm forgetting his name, I think it's Duncan MacArthur, the, the, I think it's the Faculty of Education building is named after him, so that's not right. He was a faculty member in the history program here. So I'm assuming you know who he is. He was the Minister of Education. This document is just, uh, he's asking for money to cover the uh, superintendent, uh, cover the evaluation of day schools and residential schools in the 1940s. And the other document is about hiring a teacher for Curve Lake uh, front out of Queen's uh, Faculty of Education. So on that note, I think we'll leave it uh, there. Um, sorry for running a little bit long. Hopefully you found this um, enlightening and hopefully maybe a little inspiring uh, to, um, to uh, encourage work uh, here at Queen's. I should, we should also say that we're part of a larger group coordinated by uh, Mariana Valverde at University of Toronto that's bringing scholars together who are doing this type of work. So there's a bit of a working group from, uh, across uh, university campuses that is developing, but not in, it, it, sorry, it's we were just talking, yeah, that's right, we were just talking in the car, well, it doesn't, it kind of exists, but doesn't exist. <laughs> and and Caitlin Harvey did do a piece in the conversation about the, uh, about Commonwealth universities and their participation in the dispossession of Indigenous peoples from their lands. So that's she's building off of her work with her dissertation there. So you might want to take take a look at the conversation. We also just had a converse, uh, had 
a piece in the conversation about much about this work that came out yesterday. If you want to take a look at it. Like, so the stuff I presented about the Huron Missionary Museum is like really fresh. Like, just we just kind of began learning about this this summer. Uh, so I, I I think it needs to be developed in a much more complex way. I think that I I, I, I pre presented it. Um, uh, Elspeth's uh, book, though, I have not read. I have seen, uh, and <laughs> yes, <laughs> and am and am uh, definitely aware of, and certainly. Certainly, uh, just even thinking about uh, her other work uh, definitely relates to this. And so I, I appreciate you um, putting that kind of, that'll, front, the, that'll move that up the reading list, so to speak, uh, in, in, uh, in bringing that forward. I also will just say, it's one of the, one of the reasons why I was trans trying to be transparent about where that source came from about Peach and the, her the heraldry is because uh, it's like, if you look up <laughs> Alfred Peach, like you can Google search it now, you'll land on Westerns page where Western, Western does say this, but that's the only place I've seen it. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I definitely have a long reading list. I have like stacks of books on, you know, post-colonial perspectives of higher education. So, and I am, my work is a bit based in a colonial approaches to education, so I, I have more research to do in that area, and I know that I have a lot of reading to do. So, I appreciate those, those references. Thank you. This was really fantastic. I'm Karen Vinci. Um, it occurs to me that there are a couple, as, as, you were, as you were going through your presentation, I was thinking of uh, the, you know, the current moment and the things that I've observed 
here at Queen's that are impediments to difficulties around sometimes conflicts about uh, um, decolonization. In, you know, in, and I realize that's a big word, but in, in general terms, within, within institutions. Number one, and in no order, number one, institutions, alluding to something Daniel just said, in institutions in general, maybe universities in particular, are not very good at introspection, except when it's celebratory. <laughs> number two, um, in universities are not, are not supposed to really, it's not just look within, but also look where you are. Right? The universities are not local. They're not supposed to be local. Right. Most of us in this room are not from here. Most faculty are not from here. Very few students even are not from here. And the idea then that, and I've seen this come up in, for example, in hiring discussions, the idea, not in this department actually, I'm involved in another department as well, global development studies, the idea that you would consult local communities as you're making a hiring in something to do with indigenous issues is about as far, as far away from cosmopolitan, modern, sophisticated university practice traditionally as you could imagine, right? We're not supposed to think locally. We're supposed to think, um, and our experience is uh, generally that we, we think beyond because we're professors and profess. Um, how does that, I realize I'm having trouble putting those thoughts into a, a very specific question for you, but those must be things that one encounters when one thinks about doing, making the university into a local institution, from an indigenous perspective or from, frankly, any other kind of perspective. How have you, do you see what I'm saying and how do you grapple with that? And I, I too don't know if people here at Queen's are embarking on this kind of work. I imagine there probably are, maybe in scattered, you know, scattered individual locations. What's your advice for making universities more accountable to the local? Mm. You, it's interesting to hear hear you how you frame that because I think it's very insightful and you you really are getting at something that I probably take for granted, right? And maybe you were able to, to articulate it and see it. I, I think the the place based approach to our work, especially the website, we really we, we had some interesting discussions like the timeline, <laughs> you know, and the linear approach to 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 to, to, to telling this story. We were like. I was struggling <laughs> with like, oh, do I want to do I want to participate in that? So we're really thinking about starting with a map of the territory mm -hmm. on our website to really disrupt that, right? And say, well, where is Western first to show it, uh, not just geographically but politically and, and from an indigenous kind of paradigm, if you will, you know, from another perspective to start the website there. So how how I know I'm conscious of it. In how we like how we tell that story through film, through the website, how do we tell it in a different way that privileges those things is always on the top of my mind because I'm an, a scholar that takes uh, an indigenous uh, decolonial approach, and I feel accountable to the community. I'm going to be held accountable to represent those stories in a good way. So how do we do that? And that's not the way that the university tells its story. And I totally agree with you in terms of being very careful about how we draw on those particular stories from the pub public affairs communication <laughs> standpoint. So um, I know I'm aware of it, um, but I'm going to think more and like let that percolate because it's insightful. I don't know if you have something else. Yeah, the one thing I would say to that is Western's history, this is kind of coming, coming from the President's reports that we read, so the President files an annual report, at least up until the 1970s, I think go much past. Uh, that make it progressively longer, but Western is actually framed, at least in the 1910s and the 1920s, around surveying southwestern Ontario. That's kind of how they frame the identity. And, um, and, and why that's important is because the work these museums are doing are, um, they're trying to define the London's urban uh, community in particular in a very specific way. I think uh, it's making it very clear there are very few Indigenous people uh, around London. The and, and in fact, you see this in Jury's writing, the Indigenous people that you encounter are uh, 
and, and well, he just uses offensive language to describe them. They're not uh, real indigenous people, right? They, they've, uh, they've, and, and, and that's part of, uh, of what's uh, going on here. And also the way the university, your point about universities not wanting to um, uh, engage in a process of introspection, I think is, is, is spot on because uh, what, what got me involved in this is people kept on saying, well, there are these, there's this one indigenous person in, what, in Huron's founding, and that isn't that it isn't that neat is is kind of how it's described, and um, very quickly uh, because I because I look at colonialism in schooling, I was coming across people who are engaging with Huron University College in this in, in this world, and they are not at all part of that narrative, and and I think that if we begin to revisit uh, the 19th century in particular. Um, the 19th, the 19th century, although there's people in the room who know this much more deeply than I do, uh, is much more dynamic and diverse than a lot of, especially local histories and university histories are kind of, they're not all the worst, but they're, well, I, we were, where did we say the, Don, what was that, Donald, uh, anyways, what was that place we stayed at last night? The, 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 the conference center. Donald was that? Donald Gordon. The Donald Gordon Center, thank you. It has a Queen's history in the lobby, and I was flipping through it, and there's, uh, anyways, that's the type of, yeah, there are some, and I, we did, we, I didn't have the time to go through, like Hilda Neatby right, wrote a history of Queen's, and I haven't, I didn't go through that, so I'm not entirely sure. There are some more critical uh, histories of, of universities, but they're, um, I think th this is part and parcel, and I think you're, you're getting at it, is universities both want to be local, but then they also want to define the local in very particular ways, uh, and uh, which I think uh, is problematic actually for both the past and the present. Hi, uh, Tony Dilley. I do early modern European history, so I'm, I, I don't really know too much about this. I'm curious about the early uh, graduates from Western and other universities, the indigenous graduates, and if there's any sense that um, they. Um, they change the institution from uh, from within. Did they impart any kind of indigenous knowledge or ways of seeing? I mean, I, I presume. I, f first of all, what what types of subjects did they say? Were they more sort of practical, like law or medicine? And and I mean, that's what I'm presuming. Uh, and uh, if, if they were, is, is there any way to get at? Is there a way? You know, education is a two-way street. Is there any way to sense and um, uh, how they could? have you know, change the institution. So, for example, in, in law school, there are constantly debates. You look at things, treaties and things from a different perspective, or, or medicine, obviously, there, there's different perspectives on that. And obviously, divinity, you've got, uh, you, you, some of the early people you said were Anglican ministers, and uh, I, I'm just, just, um, yeah, I, anyway, I'm just coming from this from a, I guess, early modern European perspective, where the, the kind of missionaries would go and follow St. Paul's uh, uh, admonition to be all things to all people. So you had these missionaries changing completely with the new cultures. So you know, in the 17th century, you had something called the Silk and Cotton Debate, where Jesuit missionaries in China come back as Confucius, Confucian scholars, and and so you have you know Chinese ideas influencing Christianity. But um, but so my question is about the early graduates of um, Western and other indigenous. Uh, students, um, is there a sense of them? Um, what was their presence like in these universities? Did they have an effect on, you know, change anything from within? <laughs> well, Norm, uh, Norman Lickers is really interesting because there's a whole master's thesis book Norman Lickers, and he was very active. Mm -hmm. I don't like he he was he was visibly and and named as indigenous. So it was indigenous. It wasn't like kept. He, but as he progresses in his career, he becomes a lot more political and uh, works towards the Indian Brotherhood and, and uh, like you know, establishing the Indian Brotherhood. He's 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 very um, prominent in Indian rights movement in in London nationally. So, he, but when he's going to university in the 1930s, uh, we don't see any evidence of that. But when you when you go into the 70s you do see some evidence of indigenous peoples pushing back um, in the 70s, trying to get indigenous studies programs started in the 70s, not having success. Um, if you know of David Newhouse, he is uh, the chair of indigenous studies at Trent University, a very prominent figure on the indigenous education scene 
and he is you know doing all sorts of work at the student leadership level at the he's teaching he's an instructor he's working on committees and his indigeneity and indigenous perspective is informing his work but you don't really see that as much in the 30s but there's like we don't have a lot of evidence we have a couple yeah of, no. you know if I could just pick up on that, we go back to the 18th century. There's uh, somebody like Samson Occam, who uh, was, uh, he's a Mohegan uh, man, student, uh, <coughs> studied under Eliezer Wheelock, who founded Dartmouth College. And, and Occam goes to England, he fundraises. He actually raises most of the funds that start Dartmouth College. And then he becomes quite uh, dissuaded. He actually has this great quotation in a letter to Wheelock where he says, I thought we were building an alma mater, and instead uh, you've built an alma mater which I don't know why that, but that means a white, uh, white mother, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and, um, and so Occam, when, and, and there's a lot of literature on Occam, but Occam very much has a, vi a, a, a very distinct vision for what he's trying to build that's different than Wheelock. Um, and there's a huge falling out in the, in the uh, 1770s uh, because of that. And, and so then we have all these people in between. And, uh, and, and there's, there are a fair, I, I don't mean to say all these people, because really, probably if I counted them up, there's probably about 20 people I could probably name. But um, Osage, Osage uh, uh, literary critic Robert Warrior talks about uh, an indigenous and intellectual tradition kind of developing in the 19th century. And I think that is somewhat mm -hmm. uh, a good way to describe at least the first half of the 19th century. And uh, there really, I don't think, has been enough critical engagement with pe people like Peter Edmund Jones, who is here. His thesis, I don't know anything, about, I really don't know more other than his thesis is about traditional medicine, and that's like one page in a, in a, in a biography of him, so don't, don't quote me on this, right? But, but I think people like him, I think, uh, are, uh, need to be looked at collectively and from, this, and from this perspective, because it's really difficult to determine what exactly, you know, I, what does Isaac Barefoot want in Western? It, it, we really don't, don't know. Um, he, he occupies a kind of controversial position in Six Nations uh, at the time. So it's, you know, I wouldn't really want to, you know, I don't want to over uh, emphasize what he, what he wants out of that. But I think it's really important to emphasize that people are, it's not just him, are, are active in thinking about what Western could be. And then signaling to people like Occam, signaling to people, people like Lickers, that it's, we should be careful in the assumptions we make about, about the work that they're doing. Uh, oh, <laughs> like a, yeah, uh, maybe we'll work our way uh, from the back and then there and there, and then we're probably out of time. Is that right, Jeffrey? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, thank you. I was wondering, how are you dealing with matters of representation, which is one of the things that Bruce Bogle addresses in the dilemma of ethnicity? Um, Overrepresentation, underrepresentation, because we know that archives are not the best. Answer that exactly. I guess there there is, from an institutional standpoint, the institutional official record. There's huge gaps. I think a lot of indigenous uh, work was happening, but isn't getting recorded. Jeremy is happening. Like just think about some of us that do that kind of work off the side of our desk, and it doesn't go into a report, an official document, or the it's not part of the administrative structure. So it just never gets. Um, so there's a lot of limitations in our work. It's not getting at that. Um, of course, when we talk to people, sometimes we, we get leads and we can dig and find things, but it's it's hard to say with any certainty that there was no that, like there was no indigenous people studying at the university in in, in the, the 20s. They weren't collecting that information. Now they do collect indigenous self-identification data, but that's only since 2014. You know, so we'll be able to document that and identify that there's huge limitations, especially because it's changed over time at such a vast time. So there's a lot of challenges, I think, with being with being able to make any claims on this. I think we're going to point to some really interesting points, uh, pockets of presence, and, and maybe people can 
pick up on that and do deeper investigation. I don't know if that's kind of tackling what you were talking about or sure. even. In, there's a whole other conversation about indigenous <laughs> representation yeah. that I realize I'm not going to. Yeah, but I yeah. just if I can just pick up on that uh, really quickly. I think the other piece with this project is we, is we just kind of want to put it out there because, especially with the oral history interviews, uh, we've learned uh, several things about Western that would never come up through an institutional history. So there's something called this. Um, Secretariat of Southern First Nations, which uh, was involved in supporting Indigenous students outside of the university structure for well before Indigenous services existed. And that came out through the, through the oral uh, interviews. And also, we know of several people now who worked at the university in various capacities as administrative assistants in the cafeteria uh, from, uh, from local First Nations as well. And so the, that question of representation in this project is one that we're trying to explore to create a culture of openness rather than restriction because, um, yeah, because I mean the early history really was tied to Six Nations uh, and set and, and very little Indigenous presence. And when you begin to think about different forms of labor, uh, different ways people engage with the university, uh, we see a very kind of different, uh, different story. Um, yeah, yeah the, I think the film will be really interesting because with our ethics, with film, like the people that we're talking to are Indigenous and they're waving their anonymity part of the film and they're sharing their stories in their own words right and we're working with them to make sure that they're comfortable with how we're representing their stories but are they representative of all indigenous peoples and of you know the local groups like, there's lots of gaps there's lots of gaps and limitations in this work for sure for sure and there's some ethical things that we have to work through when you know working with people's knowledge because we're, 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 we're working with real people here not not just documents Maybe we'll take the next two questions together and then wrap things up because I, I think class starts at like. Either way. Oh, okay, okay. Let's just take the next two questions. Um, thank you so much for your talk. You are setting a place in your methodology and outlet. Extremely interesting. You got me thinking. Is there any like buildings or classrooms that you would like to be tied to indigenous people and like how does that figure into your research it's much more, well, I mean, the, the name of your <laughs> college probably we need to like, you know, we're going to probably have to grapple with some of those early representations or misrepresentations. There's some interesting stories around that too. But I, I think more recently, especially around convocation, there's some interesting like more recent uh, work in convocation. Uh, there's a gonfalon, an indigenous gonfalon. We have part, part of the, the ceremony now that's come into effect. There's um, so we're going to highlight those things on the website and capture them in the film because that's you know post TRC since 2015 you're seeing like a, a huge shift. There's still a lot of problems <laughs> with what's going on, but and we'll be we'll come be coming from that critical decolonial lens to and settler colonial lens to kind of unpack that. But um, yeah, there's some sort of new buildings. There's need. Yeah, so there's there's some some of that uh, that we've captured that we'll be able to capture. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the biggest site, uh, Western, really, there is no, all, most of the presence is recent uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. I'm looking at Candace because she's been mm -hmm. there longer now. Um, but the Museum of Ontario Archaeology has a, which is a physical space, has a lot of baggage around it. Uh, and um, is really, has very complex relationships, yeah. really since the 1970s. I would say it had no, almost no relationships until the 1970s. And then it still has very, it tends to interpret Haudenosaunee or the mm -hmm. Iroquoian uh, culture, Trinatan culture, uh, as opposed to Anishinaabe, Oneida, or uh, Muncie Delaware culture, which are the first peoples right around where we are. Uh, and so there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the last 30 or 40 years around that specific space. But they don't. They've had a, like a, ch a change in the name, right? Because Indian and <laughs> not really appropriate anymore. So that's changed. Um, they had a really problematic logo that had a lot of controversy around it with, you know, feather and Indian headdress kind of thing. Um, so, you know, there's those kinds of, uh, and there's been some community unrest about that, you know, and, and, and uh, people did talk about it in the interviews as well in terms of like really um, trying to, to get them to change that. So that's, <laughs> There's a name. It's not not an indigenous name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a bit different than Queens, where there's 
the Brant building, right? Uh, it's just student residence, and there's a few other points on campus, I think, where there's a little bit more of a... Representation, yeah. Yeah, I hesitate. I'm not I hesitate to speak anything of them other than I know they exist. <laughs> anyway, anyways, we take thoughts. Um, thank you for this super fascinating uh, discussion. My name is Joy, and I'm a second year PhD student. I also previously worked in heritage film, so I love the idea that you're putting a film out there. I think that's so powerful, and it's a really great way to reach more people with your research. So good for you for doing that. My question is about the film, which I recognize that Sally is not here, but. Um, is it is it going to include some of this this sort of historical narrative that you brought forward today, or is it just going to be the oral history? Obviously, the oral history interviews are going to be super powerful and, and, and an impactful part of the film. But I think having this historical background will make that pop even more. And I'm I'm wondering about that, and also how how the marketing of the film is going to happen. Because again, I think which might be way down the line, but <laughs> I think it's a huge it's a huge opportunity to sort of share this story with a really wide audience. And I think your timing of this is, is really strong. So yeah, the the vision for sure is to have the historical context in there. Um, I think that's you know going to bring the the academic piece to it and 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 people's like people's stories as well. So mm -hmm. it'll be a combination, but we're it's too soon to, to know exactly how that's going to unfold because we're really we're gonna work closely with Sally. She is the lead on that and we are like just part of the team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we've been working with her all the way through. So it's not like she's coming in later. It's like she we've been in conversation with her all the way through. Yeah. Well I'm sure this conversation can go on much longer because this is a timely and Really eye opening, excellent presentation. We will have further questions if we're having lunch with you. We're here, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, or email us. Okay. You can find our email information online. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, a lot of coffee cookies for people as you're leaving, but before, um, uh, let's have one final round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.